Could you tell us something about your, your background in politics and maybe also in broader sense? First uh, of all, uh, thank you very much for the attention you paid to our visit. And uh, of course, uh, uh, what I do here, I was invited by a foundation. And we met with the different politicians in Europe and yesterday in Brussels and the European Parliament. And we continue our meetings here in uh, Holland with our colleagues uh, for social democracy. By views, by my political credo, I'm a social demo democrat. And many times, many, many years in Russian Federation, tried to organize social democratic party. Unfortunately, I don't know why. Although Russia is, is a social democratic part, uh, country by mentality, but all our uh, uh, initiatives failed by different reasons. So the last one, not the last, the previous uh, one was the just Russia, but I recommend you to forget combination uh, of the combination of words, uh, I mean, just Russia and social democracy, because there is nothing in common with uh, these two notions. And you know, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, just Russia betrayed the interests of uh, many voters. And you know, it uh, uh, became a parliamentary party thanks to its oppositional position, oppositional views, um, and uh, such uh, deputies, such politicians like Ilya Panamaryov, Dmitry Gutkov, uh, Oksana Dmitriev, and some others. And, I took part also a little bit in the election campaign of this party, but unfortunately then it changed the position radically and uh, all whom I uh, mentioned now were expelled from this party and I think uh, there is nothing interesting in it because it's not a party but a part of a uh, uh, political establishment in the state of it's not an oppositional party at all. It's my opinion and not only my, my opinion, it's the opinion of uh, 100,000 uh, Russian citizens who voted for this party. Why did you have to leave the Duma? Uh, it's a kind of political reasons, I should say, uh, because uh, uh, my, my fault, my fault uh, uh, was uh, determined by voting of uh, my polit political opponents, I mean just Russia and uh, the so-called Liberal Democratic Party by Mr. Zhirinovsky. In fact, it's a kind of uh, the a kind of a kind of reserve uh, of the of, of Kremlin's reserve in the State Duma. When they need a majority, they use uh, Zhirinovsky as an uh, instrument for this. And uh, uh, well, there was no trial, no investigation, no lawyers, no uh, uh, even uh, it, no attempts even to. <coughs> Uh, explain the situation. I was ex uh, uh, mandate, uh, stripped of my uh, deputy mandate, uh, mandate by votes of 265. I don't remember exactly, but I was elected as a deputy of State Duma, the existing uh, parliament of Russian Federation, the existing uh, State Duma, by votes of 200 and uh, more than uh, uh, 200,000 people living in Moscow. Yes. Thank you. Could you tell us something about yourself? Sure. Um, I work uh, at the University of Leiden. I'm currently working on my PhD thesis. And uh, the thesis is about uh, why people uh, want authorities to rule them, for what kind of reasons, and what are the, the motives there that make people believe that uh, these are the right people to rule us. And, I've been studying Russia for quite a long time. Uh, I started actually with a master's degree in international relations, focusing on post-Soviet area and Russia as the main case already in Poland. Then I studied uh, my methodology to be a better researcher in, uh, in Bristol. And now I am actually conducting the research myself. And uh, I've done some interviews also with, uh, with civil society organizations in Russia. So I think that's how I can justify my presence here. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Tony van der Tocht, please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a former diplomat at uh, the moment uh, on secondment to uh, our Institute of International Affairs Klingendaal in The Hague, working there as a researcher on uh, EU-Russia relations, NATO-Russia relations, wider Europe-Eurasian Union. 
Um, and uh, as a diplomat, I uh, uh, served in Moscow and in Petersburg and in Kazakhstan. So I was quite involved with uh, the, uh, the area and also with Russia. Uh, also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I uh, was head of the uh, Eastern Europe Central Asia Department for quite some time and um, was the coordinator of the Netherlands Russia year two years ago, so which was also quite a challenge. Yeah, you can say that. <laughs> it was an interesting year, I guess. Um, well, first, uh, first I would like to uh, discuss a little bit um, what is the Russian opposition, or maybe what is left of the Russian opposition. We were all, of course, shocked by the news of the assassination of uh, uh, Nemtsov. Um, yesterday, we saw a report coming out uh, on the war in Ukraine. Actually, speculations are that this report might have the reason why Mr. Nemtsov was killed. Um, we've also seen some attempts to set to for the opposition to unite behind uh, one party and one party. So maybe my first question would be: What's the current state of affair in uh, the Russia of the Russian Federation, the Russian opposition? Okay, <clears throat> you know it's not an easy question <laughs> uh, because uh, we live under. Uh, Situation, uh, under circumstances when we have uh, local localized repressions against many people who dare to criticize uh, authorities. And uh, the number of leaders of Russian opposition uh, very quickly reduces. Uh, a lot of them are now in prison or arrested or uh, having have some punishment, uh, administrative uh, criminal. Etc. But nevertheless, we're still alive, some of us still alive, and still uh, fight and struggle against uh, what we, uh, against what, with what we are not agree in uh, Putin's regime. Um, you know, uh, in fact, the situation in the Russian Federation, uh, to my mind, to my private estimation, to my private point of view, is getting worse, uh, steadily getting worse, and in fact, uh, as we take not words but deeds, uh, we see that the country is prepared for further repressions and for further reprisals. Uh, you know, State Duma, unfortunately, because I four times was elected as a deputy of State Duma, and uh, the State Duma turned into, uh, seriously changed and turned into what journalists uh, say, mad, crazy printer. It's a uh, nickname of the Russian state too, unfortunately. And this mad printer uh, makes every month uh, some repressive laws, uh, different laws. In fact, we see the preparations uh, for further uh, repressions, political repressions. And many uh, court decisions, so they are absolutely politically motivated, unfortunately. Um, if we, uh, we see, uh, if we have some uh, criminal trials, we see sometimes mistakes, but nevertheless in criminal sphere, the courts work so-so, more or less uh, fair. But if uh, we have political affairs, politically motivated affairs, no laws work. No laws are, uh, are, followed. are followed, yes. Uh, I, I warned you about my English. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the situation is not very good. Uh, if we uh, speak, for example, about uh, democratic values, uh, there is none in Russian, almost none in Russian Federation, what we call democracy. In fact, we have abolished uh, all elections, all possibilities during election campaigns. There are a lot of different obstacles, different barriers, to register candidates or to register parties or uh, any bureaucrat from uh, the bullying, uh, bullying um, commission can uh, exclude any candidate uh, by no reason because he, will have, uh, he could have a command from above. And uh, under these circumstances, of course, we 
cannot realize uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the certain level of support we have, I mean, the Russian opposition. If we take, if, if we take the society, I think approximately one-third uh, is definitely support, so, uh, one-third definitely supports Russian opposition, not less, maybe even more. In some cities, like, in some big cities like uh, Moscow, St. Petersburg, uh, this uh, figure is even more. But, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, uh, in how can you uh, be, uh, uh, how can you use uh, elections if they are completely falsified? I can give you one example, maybe of the last one. There was an election campaign in Balashika. Uh, it's a big city uh, there, uh, very close to Moscow. In fact, it's a part of Moscow. And uh, uh, these elections were not on only falsified, we were used to it. All observers, all observers, independent observers, were, were um, taken away from uh, polling stations. Many of them, many of them, were severely beaten by bandits, hooligans, we don't know, but they uh, acted under cover of police. And one of observers uh, was seriously wounded and uh, operated and he was removed his plea. Just imagine what kind of elections we had in 20 kilometers from the Kremlin. About the legitimacy, you are just studying that. Um, many times when you see, for instance, the Dutch media uh, talking about Russia, they are saying, of course, this is not a democracy, but there is massive support for Mr. Putin. There are no opinion polls about that, but, but still, so that is taken as more or less a fact. Could you explain about, what, do you have, what's your opinion about the legitimacy of the regime? I think when we talk about legitimacy, we can look at the procedural side of legitimacy versus the public opinion side of legitimacy. So procedurally, when you have a democracy, you would expect free and fair elections as the first step for all the parties to be able to actually gain access to power. And as we've heard just now, there are all kinds of limitations. And this has to do with the particular system. I am not saying that non-democratic systems cannot be legitimate at all. Uh, but in the particular procedural electoral sense, we have a problem with legitimacy then, if we assume that Russia is a sort of democracy. On the other hand, actually, when we decide that it is not a democracy, we can look into the public opinion more uh, and try to find answers about legitimacy there. So let's say it's a competitive authoritarian regime, although I already have a problem with competitive here because, again, uh, the access to competition of different parties is very limited. Um, when we think about the public opinion, actually there are many opinion polls and they are also provided by independent institutions that show actually a large support for uh, Vladimir Putin. It doesn't mean, though, that the regime is as a whole legitimate, because when we already look at different institutions in Russia, as police, as courts, as uh, State Duma, we see that the support is quite low. At least it's much lower than for the person of Vladimir Putin. Um, so just on the face value of this, uh, uh, this public opinion polls, well, we could say that if we talk about legitimacy of anybody, then it's Vladimir Putin and his popularity that sparks the legitimacy. Um, so this is one side to it. On the other hand, if we know that um, actually the system is not an open system, that we have limitations in freedom of speech, can we trust this kind of public opinion polls? Uh, if you live in a system where it is much easier to access certain goods or services uh, while you support the regime, because it's all structured in some vertical of power, um, you have access to jobs, you have access to better education, to better healthcare, then would you be really open about uh, not supporting the system? So it's some kind of question of conformity and self-interest that is protected by people. And I think this comes really close to what was very common under communism, actually, when people held certain opinions privately about the, the system, and this was maybe even more common in Eastern Europe, but in public, only one kind of opinion was appropriate, and people would even pick on those who would express uh, an opposition to, to the system and report them. This is how the system was arranged. So I am not completely sure whether we, we can trust this opinion polls to, to that extent. But looking at closely at the opposition, what kind of trends would you uh, identify? 
Well, around the elections, I hope that uh, there was a kind of well, new spirit, a new broad movement uh, for uh, well, against corruption, for free and fair elections. And there was, well, especially in Moscow, Petersburg, and some other big cities, there was a huge turnout um, with uh, people from, well, different opinions, from very left-wing to, well, right-wing nationalist type. But somehow they seem to come together around a broad platform. Um, and um, there were also people from a younger generation participating for the first time who had never had felt even the inclination to participate in such kind of opposition mm -hmm. movements or big demonstrations. And so this was something which brought the opposition together and well, I, it reminded me a bit of well, bigger uh, demonstrations in the early 90s. Or, uh, so I thought there was a kind of new spirit and there was also a new generation, of course, taking part. And unfortunately, after the elections, well, partly it's because of repression, repressive movements, uh, actions taken, uh, um, measures, uh, but yeah, it's also partly the, the opposition fell apart. Uh, a lot of infighting. Um, so, well, part of the the fact that the opposition today is very much split is is uh, because of the repression, of course. But another part is because of all these kind of internal divisions which came up immediately afterwards. And so, in fact, I'm waiting for let's say, a, 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 gal, a, a cause, a common cause, which would galvanize the opposition. And I was wondering when I saw the, this report on, uh, uh, which was presented by Ia Yashin yesterday, on the, uh, the war in, in, in Ukraine and the Russian involvement in that, and um, the Russian soldiers who are dying, and whether this could be a galvanizing cause to bring the opposition together. Of course, you cannot completely believe this opinion polls and some people just give an answer because they think that is the right, what is expected of them. Uh, but still, I think there is a huge support for uh, the present regime. And I'm, in fact, I'm, in a way, I'm surprised. Uh, I see that the propaganda is obviously effective. But I'm waiting for the first cracks to appear in that in that consensus. Is the names of reports such a crack, or could this be a common cause for the opposition? How do you judge that? First of all, I should say that uh, Nemtsov's report was could not be the reason for uh, uh, for his assassination and uh, murder, which is was of course politically motivated. Um, the report doesn't consist of um, many new facts. Uh, these facts mostly from the open uh, sources. In, uh, this informa some information is from families. And you won't uh, know something, uh, much, uh, won't uh, new, much uh, news from this report. And, and maybe fortunately, maybe unfortunately, but uh, it's a good reason to draw attention of public in Russian Federation, both in Russian Federation and abroad, to this problem, of course. Uh, the information in a report is absolutely objective, objective, truthful, and uh, a, 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 I should say a very good research of people and, uh, for the, and Boris Nimsov himself. As for report, um, I don't think it will give uh, much no opportunities uh, opposition leaders or opposition in Russia to unite. I think the uh, process of of, unite, uh, of process of uniting will be finished uh, uh, up uh, to uh, 2016 because we tried. Uh, I took part in all negotiations and all sittings and all talks and uh, it was mostly my initiative to uh, my attempt to make a broader coalition between uh, leaders of existing opposition in the Russian Federation. Unfortunately, we uh, somehow failed. It's not a complete failure, but maybe it's a temporary failure. Uh, till this moment, we couldn't organize a broader coalition. 
maybe it's uh, the question of further months or, or um, maybe 2016. Я попробую по-русски сказать несколько слов, да как Марина будет говорить. Ну попробую сказать несколько слов по-русски по ситуации с оппозицией. I will try to say a couple of sentences, words about the situation and opposition in Russia. Ну, действительно, состоялось два заседания в, широкой, в широком составе коалиции, которые готовил ваш покорный слуга вместе с рядом коллег. There were indeed two sittings of the opposition that, was, that were organized by yours truly with a number of colleagues. Но я так понимаю, что, к сожалению, к моему, по крайней мере, сожалению, Внутри оппозиции образовалось как бы два крыла. Одно более умеренное, другое более решительное. Не хочу сказать радикально, это было бы неправда. И вот та часть нашей оппозиции, наш уважаемый товарищ, к которому мы с великим уважением относимся, в первую очередь это Михаил Касьянов, это Алексей Навальный, Илья Яшин, они объявили о создании коалиции. Ну, скажем так, не совсем корректно это сделано, на наш взгляд. And so that part of the opposition, so the more resolved part, uh, whom uh, people that we respect very much, Um, have uh, now announced that they will be creating an, uh, a coalition, uh, which was done, to be honest, in not a very correct way. Slightly not correct. И мы сейчас считаем, что нам надо продолжать процесс расширения коалиции, может быть, объединить вот это более умеренное крыло, и на каком-то другом уже этапе договориться и прийти к действительно единой вот этой широкой коалиции. Такую задачу мы перед собой ставим. Мы ни в коем случае не допустим раскола. По крайней мере, сделаем все, чтобы это не произошло. So we believe now that we should still continue this process of trying to form a broader coalition, which will include also the moderate wing. And in any case, we will definitely not allow the opposition to split. My name is Sofia Bonienko. I'm the correspondent from the Netherlands for Radio Svoboda, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. Um, yeah, I, I'm just, um, I was actually very shocked to hear about that break between you guys. I think it's very sad that it happened. And I, I wonder whether Mr. Goodkov thinks that the Kremlin is going to use it in some way, because the, the main strategy the Kremlin is using so far in Europe and inside Russia is divide and rule. Do you think uh, there's been any implication that this was done purposefully? First of all, I think, I wrote this in a public statue, that in Russia there is not an economic crisis, but a system crisis. First of all, my opinion is, and I've wrote an article about this recently, that in Russia there's actually not just an economic crisis, it's a systemic crisis. Системный кризис никогда не кончается. Кончается, как правило, ну, два варианта. Первый вариант – это глубокие, полити... глубокие политические и экономические реформы, способные остановить вот этот кризис. Второй вариант – это смена власти, которая может происходить разными способами, начиная от дворцовых переворот, кончая вооруженными восстаниями или революцией роста, как это было на Кавказе. Um, and as systemic crises go, uh, they usually end up in one of two possible scenarios. One is either uh, deep reforms that will stop this crisis, and the other one unfortunately leads to uh, confrontation, to even bloodshed, maybe revolutions, as uh, the color revolutions that we saw in other countries, or indeed confrontation within the country in civil war-like scenarios. Поэтому, конечно, кризис в перспективе в определенном будет играть на руку оппозиции, если так можно вообще выразиться корректно. Но So yes, in, in a way you could say that a crisis could be to the benefit of the opposition, although it's not entirely correctly putting it, but you could think that way. Но он создает дополнительные опасности для самой оппозиции, для государства, для власти, поскольку он может перерасти какие-то уличные формы по смене власти и может, конечно, только привести к масштабным гражданским конфликтам. 
but also presents a danger to the opposition as well as to the state and to state structures because it could grow into streets confrontations and streets violence, which is uh, for both not beneficial. Если мы говорим о сегодняшнем дне, то на сегодняшний день э, кризис э, всего лишь накапливает предпосылки снижения доверия к власти. Пока каких-либо серьезных, заметных, видимых изменений нет, но это просто потому, что э, инерция общественно-политических процессов всегда очень велика по времени. Uh, lessens trust in government structures. Um, these kind of processes usually take much more time uh, to, to lead where they will lead. И uh, вот uh, здесь еще очень важный вопрос, uh, скажем так, отношение элит uh, к сегодняшней ситуации. Uh, есть внутренние серьезные противоречия в элитах, но они пока не привели к расколу элит. Это я вам говорю совершенно честно. А в России все серьезные политические проблемы, все серьезные политические преобразования начинаются с раскола элит. Вопрос этот, безусловно, не за горами, но, наверное, нужно какое-то время. But we're not yet, we're quite far away yet from a split of elites. And we know from our history that any real political change, any deep political changes in Russia have always occurred when there's a split of elites. And this will still take some time, we don't see it yet. Поэтому, если мы говорим о кризисе, да, безусловно, он станет, на мой взгляд, либо отцом политических реформ, либо могильщиком действующей власти. If we're speaking about this systemic crisis now, then yes, you could say that it will either give birth to uh, reforms or it will be, mean the death of uh, the government. Uh, this economic crisis, which is what well, very present at the moment, what does that do to the Russian citizens? What, what can you uh, see? Well, first of all, here I think we have to also go back to all the problem with the propaganda. The, the, the regime propaganda is very strong. So when you look at uh, the public opinion service, actually what we saw uh, with the annexation of Crimea was a really huge boost in popularity of the regime, in popularity of Putin especially. Uh, and that is exactly the same mechanism that uh, was in place in 2008 when uh, there happened the war with Georgia, however we refer to that incident. And that is to my view, this is a very instrumental use of this kind of policies and of propaganda to boost the popularity. Um, what is also not really um, coming true in the Russian media, especially the pro-governmental media, is that the, the economic sanctions are actually two sets of sanctions. One where the sanctions imposed on Russia, which were actually uh, targeting very small elites, people that are involved in some way in uh, what is going on in Ukraine, uh, an intervention there, and there were the contra sanctions that were imposed by Putin. And these are actually the sanctions that are felt by the people. So the problem with uh, imports, exports, limitations, the increase in prices, so inf inflation going on uh, already for a while. Later, of course, also the oil prices uh, that influenced it. This is what people actually can feel. But how the state presents it is actually that this is all the fault of the West, the US. Does this and propaganda doesn't work? It works. It is very effective. So really there is a, a pretty widespread, also among well-informed people, believe that this is the fault of the well, US or uh, European intervention in the Ukrainian matters. And that is how the West is trying to diminish the role of, of mm -hmm. Russia. So where it comes to the domestic politics, perhaps Russian society is much more critical and can, can be critical. But when it comes to the international scene, it seems that even the most well-informed people are much more influenced by the, by the propaganda. And, and also, uh, sadly, it reaches the, the you know, very educated young people. Uh, the sanctions, of course, were, the, our sanctions were targeted at uh, those decision makers or having the, the ones who have companies who either profit for, from or were involved in either destabilization of eastern Ukraine 
or uh, the annexation of Crimea. Um, of course, the idea of the European Union with these sanctions was that the, in this that that there would this would um, help to 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 make some splits in the elite. That some people who are in the broader circle of decision makers around the president would go to the president at a certain point and say, "Hey, this policy is really hurting us. Uh, shouldn't you change it?" Uh, but until now, okay, that has not been happening. And what has been happening, in fact, is that some of these close friends of President Putin, some of the oligarchs, like Mr. Sechin, who is from uh, Rasniev, they were more or less compensated uh, by, um, by the government uh, taking parts of the funds of the other funds, which in fact are uh, supposed to be there for, for the pensions. And, so in fact they are compensated uh, to the detriment of the normal Russian people. But as long as propaganda works in such a way that both the effect of the Russian counter sanctions, uh, which uh, leads to higher food prices for example in supermarkets, and uh, the fact that it becomes more difficult to pay the social services, as long as the propaganda succeeds in blaming that on the West, uh, I think the uh, consensus around President Putin uh, is still quite high. So in a way these sanctions help the regime? Uh, at the moment they do, uh, in a way, but how long? I mean, I, this cannot go on forever and I think people are not stupid. And uh, in a way when you get splits in the elite, people from the elite will also at a certain time uh, try to rally around such causes and uh, take part of the opposition with them uh, and come with some kind of counter uh, movements, uh, maybe around elections, uh, maybe outside of parliament, maybe even do demonstrations if mm -hmm. there's a certain thing happening which, uh, which helps to bring them together. Uh, is this middle class, Mr. Kutkov, a Motor for an engine for change in Russia? The средний класс у нас, к сожалению, в России это постоянно это ведь не постоянная величина. Unfortunately, the middle class in Russia is not a very constant uh, aspect. Она настолько начинает появляться, когда более-менее дела в экономике начинают идти и начинает расти средний класс. Но как ну, так как Россия постоянно попадает в кризисы различные экономические. Он в этот момент начинает быстро сокращаться. И это, к сожалению, уезжает также очень много бизнесменов. Идет серьезный вывод капитала из страны. Чтобы вы понимали цифры, это примерно 150-200 миллиардов долларов в год. Uh, unfortunately, also entrepreneurs are leaving the country. This also means that they take their businesses and their money with them. Uh, just for example, idea, we're talking about 150 to 200 million dollars. 150 to 200 million billion billion dollars a year. A year. Мы теряем, к сожалению, наш средний класс, который опоры оппозиции, и это, конечно. В целом плохо, потому что мы боимся, именно вот это слово нужно привести, мы боимся, что скоро протест на улице будет носить совершенно иной характер, нежели он носил все эти годы. So unfortunately, yes, we are losing the middle class, which has always been the, the base of the opposition support. And it's important to say that we are very afraid that this will in the end result in a very different kind of protest in the streets. We have seen, I think, the most impressive um, Liberty Parade last week in, uh, in Moscow. I, I talked to a friend who said this, that the tanks were going through the streets for, for more than an hour. He said it was absolutely crazy to watch. Um, um, how do you judge that, uh, Tony? Um, what, how do you see this, this threat coming from Russia? Is there really um, um, this threat that this will spill over to, to NATO countries like, like the Baltic states, how do you see the situation? I think the biggest problem is that you, you don't know what uh, Mr. Putin's, his, what his end aims are. 
so he doesn't. Also, you don't know, maybe he doesn't know himself uh, where. So what does he want? Uh, I mean, he is even in, as far as Ukraine is concerned, he is even still in a, situ in a state of denial that he is involved militarily there at all. And um, so it's very difficult to find a way to negotiate through negotiations to get out of this situation. So, well, the only thing you can do is to, well, reassure the other countries which can be possibly uh, a next target or of whatever kind of hybrid warfare or, or whatever. That includes the Baltic states, but uh, we should also look closely at, uh, at other uh, countries in our own eastern partnership like Moldova or Georgia. I mean, it's not only Ukraine where uh, things like this are, are happening. And, I think we should support their free choice, what they, where they want to go, and with whom they want to be uh, allies and partners. Um, and at the same time, the most difficult thing is uh, in the present situation, apart from the threats to which you can respond well, militarily by you know, having your own deterrence. Uh, it's like uh, a bit like in the Cold War uh, situation. But the most important thing is what, how to find uh, answers to um, another part of this hybrid warfare to this propaganda, uh, to how can, can we reach the, can we make sure that Russian people hear that the sanctions which we have instigated are not against the Russian people and that they suffer more from Putin's policies than from our sanctions. Can we get the message across? And are there still other ways to keep on engaging with um, other people in Russia uh, with uh, what not only opposition but also NGOs uh, without running the risk that they, they are immediately uh, repressed or branded foreign agent. Uh, can we still do anything there to, to support that, to support people who stand for changes in Russia? movement of Ukraine towards Europe uh, was actually very painful for President Putin himself, personally. He had a sort of a dream, uh, not a bad dream, uh, looking at it from uh, a Russian uh, side, to, um, to make the country stronger, to, to add population, uh, to develop it, uh, by also uniting four former Soviet republics. Ну, что-то вроде Советского Союза номер два, только э, построено на других совершенно принципах, нежели это был Советский Союз, который был идеологическим коммунистическим государством. Uh, something like the Soviet Union 2.0, uh, but only based on completely different uh, um, ideas than the Soviet Union itself, which was of course built on a, a certain idea uh, of uh, ideology of communism. И э, движение Украины к Европе было воспринято как акт предательства в Кремле. So Ukraine's movement towards Europe was actually seen in the Kremlin as an act of betrayal. И вот, э, скажем так, не совсем продуманные, не совсем логичные действия российского руководства объясняются в первую очередь острой эмоциональностью вот, восприятия этого события, то есть движения э, Украины к Европе. So the, you could say the kind of illogical or irrational uh, movements of the Kremlin in this question can be explained by a highly emotional response uh, to, this, to this Ukrainian decision, to this Ukrainian, uh, as they saw betrayal. Поэтому, была, поэтому наблюдается очень серьезная непоследовательность действий Кремля. Ну, с Крымом более-менее понятно, а вот что происходило дальше, это уже выпадало из всякой логики событий. So there's a kind of non-consequential manner of acting uh, from the side of the Kremlin. So what happened in Crimea was clear, uh, but after that, more or less, uh, but after that what happened in the east of Ukraine uh, is really beyond any logic. Обратите внимание, что сначала звучали в России слова 
о том, что половина Украины э, может присоединиться к России прямо под Днепром, по границе с Днепром. Э, потом звучали слова о том, что э, Донецкая Народная Республика, Луганская Народная Республика могут войти в состав России. И когда там в Донецке и в Луганске состоялся референдум, России не признаны итоги этого референдума. It's simple to note that in the, in the beginning uh, there was talk in Russia of half of Ukraine even joining Russia, so the border going on the Dnieper River. Uh, then there were talk of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic joining Russia. Uh, and then when they held their referendum, Russia didn't actually recognize them as such. То есть это говорит о том, что не было никакого заранее продуманного плана в отношении Украины, и именно вот острая эмоциональность объясняется вот эти не очень логически, не очень увязаны друг другу шаги. So this tells us that there wasn't actually a preconceived plan of action when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it can be explained by, again, the highly emotional character of reacting to what was happening from the side of the Kremlin. Поэтому на сегодняшний момент подобного в отношении других стран uh, вряд ли стоит ожидать. Но! So this is why I don't think uh, you should really expect a similar uh, situation to occur uh, with regards to other countries, but... I do it special, not to be interrupted. We have to understand that the events in Ukraine can cause serious changes in relations with other countries and other regions in other countries. It's important to understand that the events in Ukraine can cause certain movements in other countries when it comes to Russia, relations of Russia with other countries. И, конечно, так, не дай бог, могут быть такие, не дай бог, если что-то там будет совсем очень чувствительным, болезненным для Кремля, могут какие-то быть непродуманные, нелогичные, непоследовательные действия совершенно в других регионах. So then, if again something painful for the Kremlin occurs in some of these other regions, other countries, then again a highly emotional reaction could be evoked from the Kremlin. But at the moment there is no uh, possibility, no danger of uh, Russian aggression against any other countries. 